going to have a look around for a particularly ancient group of insects that's uh, remained relatively unchanged for a very long time since about the mid Devonian some 380 million years ago known as the bristle tails they're, they're a sister order to the zygentoma also known as the fish moths which uh, many people probably know because they eat your books and your papers in your house that's one species among many the the fish moths are actually much more widespread and diverse than the bristle tails bristle tails are archaeognatha archaic mouth parts this is like a <laughs> approximate translation of that and they they're set apart from later insect orders by a few features one of which is they don't have wings they're flightless insects they never evolved wings um they also have these appendages that come out of the back of their abdomen which from which they get their name bristle tails which are these three little bristles like hair like structures which are sensory organs and they have these these primitive mouth parts they eat fungi and lichens and so on by kind of like chopping stuff off of the substrate and uh, I've seen a few of them in dry environments but there's supposed to be quite a lot of species in these Afro-Temperate forests and I haven't seen any yet so I'm having to spot some today they can be difficult to pin down because they they spring away kind of like a shrimp they flex their whole body and launch themselves out of danger but I'm hoping to get lucky it is winter time and everything's a bit quiet right now but uh, you never know it's always some activity it's sort of a hobby horse of mine this issue of scientific names like the zygentoma archaeognatha and then coming down th those are order names so they're higher up in the taxonomic hierarchy but you come down to the Linnaean double name this designation for each species which is typically the genus and the species so uh, like the Otaniqua yellowwood I believe it's Podocarpus fulcatus and there's great value in that naming system because every species has a distinct combination there may be um, there may be halves, like, like individual names shared between species across taxa, across uh, branches on the phylogenetic tree, on the sort of family tree. But uh, the combination of the two names will be unique for every species. So it allows great precision when, you, when you're discussing species, which are indeed the basic units of ecosystems. But the thing that I don't like about it, well, is firstly that they they tend to be difficult and unlike the sort of everyday language that we use so they're difficult to remember so they become quite esoteric like uh, if if you list off latin names most people you speak to unless they're quite specialized are not going to know what you're talking about while common names tend to be descriptive so it's like you can you can sort of understand something about the species just from the the descriptive power of the common name now the problem with common names which is not to be understated is that they they're not specific at all so often a common name will be used in different parts of the world to describe quite different species and indeed to describe whole groups of species like i often hear people refer to this the, the species of the baboon spider while the baboon spider is I forget it's like an order or or, or a super family or something, but it encompasses some like two hundred species, and it gives this wrong impression. It gives the impression that like oh well, baboon spiders they're all pretty much the same thing. While there's actually huge diversity within that group, so there's definitely um, there's a trade off there. There's there's benefits to the common name and there's also deficits. But uh, for common parlance, I find common names quite useful and quite accessible, and. Yeah.
I guess I kind of have something of an aversion to spending much of my time remembering like long lists of esoteric Latin names that I, you know, that I could just fucking look up with the internet connection. It, it just seems like a poor use of human attention that, um, but you know, at the same time, I have great respect for people who've got a powerful memory that they can, they can hold in their memory a lot of Latin names. So yeah, it, uh, it gives and it takes. A good example would be Daddy Long Legs. So people use the Daddy Long Legs to refer, where I live, typically to refer to a cellar spider, which is another common name, a more specific common name. Because uh, you also get better and worse common names. Um, and I think that it's a worthy enterprise to try and improve the common names that people use. For instance, the white muscle which a lot of people dig out of the sand. You'll see people sort of wiggling like they're doing a little dance or something on the beach and they're, they're digging their feet down to, to pull out white muscles. Um, it's better described as a wedge clam. It's like a more, like a more uh, official common name because a muscle is attached to a substrate by some anchor while the, the white muscle, the wedge clam, just locomotes through the sand using its big tongue. So... Yeah, there's better and worse common names, but the daddy long legs typically here if it's the cellar spider, spider that's um, what do they call it? Anthrophilic, I believe is the term, where it, uh, it's a, it's well suited to the anthropogenic environment, to the human environment. So they live in people's cellars, hence the name, and they they're those spiders with very long, thread-like legs. And there's a rumor that they're like so poisonous, but their mouths are just so small that they can't bite you. They're rather venomous, beg your pardon. Um, and I'm not sure if that's true or not, but I guess that it's probably not. While in the US, I believe a daddy long legs is normally used to refer to an apillionid, a harvestman, which are another kind of arachnid separate to the arania, which are the spiders. Um, the harvestmen have, they have no constriction between their pros, prosthoma and opisthosoma, basically the front and the back. You know, like a spider has the front where its eyes and its head and its mouth and everything is, and then it's got a constriction, and then it's got its big abdomen, which is quite bulbous. The harvestman just has one bulbous thing with its head and everything on it. So, but otherwise, they can look superficially pretty similar to a long-legged spider, like the cellar spider. They've got these long thread, thread-like legs, and they, in um, particularly in parts of the northern hemisphere, around the harvest time, around autumn, they emerge in great numbers. They can come in these huge swarms of the landscape. They're quite harmless, and they're actually kind of charming little creatures, I think. They, none of them are venomous. None of them produce silk, a.k.a. web, like what spiders produce. Um, most of them are herbivorous. Well, I don't know if it's most of them, but many of them are, are herbivorous and many of them are predatory. They eat little mites and so on. I've indeed found quite an amazing harvestman. They're not that common in South Africa, but I found an amazing harvestman near Montague uh, in the mountains that upon examination under the microscope had quite cool mouth parts. It had... I forget the names of different arachnid mouth parts, but I think it's the chelicerae are these like outermost mouth parts that were, they'd kind of formed these little baskets almost with like branched out spines that themselves had little spines on to create like these net like organs on either side of its mouth that were big. And then inside it had, it had uh, the smaller inner mouth parts, which resembled little crab pinches, little crab claws. And um, I inferred that how it fed was it would run, and they, they were quick. They would run with their long little legs over the ground, and they'd come upon a prey item, like a, maybe a small a small bug, a small aphid, or a mite, or something like that, and scoop it up in these nets and hold it close to their mouth where their little pincers would pick it apart and gobble it up. Um... Yeah, so that was a lovely little creature. It had great big eyes. Most of the harvestmen have tiny little eyes. There's a, a general principle in biology that something that has big forward-facing eyes, overlapping fields of vision, is a predator because binocular vision, where your where your two 
eyes, though they have more than two, but they've got these sort of primary eyes. Um, where the fields of vision overlap, you have binocular vision. So you can triangulate from these two perspectives and the object you're looking at, you can there's a triangulation effect where you can gauge the distance to that object and that can be important for attacking something. So um, if you look at like big cats, big predatory cats, their eyes will be front facing. Indeed, our eyes are front facing. It'll tell you something about what we're evolved to eat. And um, if you look at prey animals, their eyes are typically over on the sides of the head so that they're just covering a wider area with their fields of vision because they're not so interested in honing in on another animal, but they're interested in spotting something that's honing in on them so they can make a hasty escape. So that's a general trend. Jumping spiders, one of my favorite groups of organisms, the Saltisidae, they have these great big beautiful eyes. They've got eight eyes, the other ones are spaced out, they're, they're smaller simple eyes around their, their sort of head that gives them this sort of 360 vision so they can watch their backs and their sides all at the same time. Like most arthropods, they're also they're prey as well as predators. Um, but they have these big eyes on the fronts, on the on the on their sort of faces where they can lock onto a fly or whatever sitting on the wall and then jump at them. So they they jump very quickly and with a lot of precision. So they they tackle down their prey like that. Yeah. So this this harvestman that I mentioned with the baskets, it had these great big eyes with overlapping fields of vision so a lot of things hinting at its uh at its ecological role there as a predator